small, <laughs> the future of culture. Um, but of course, we have 30 minutes, so I'm sure we'll cover a lot of ground. Um, but as we look at the future of culture, um, the question is, where does it take us? And I'm particularly interested in what are the surprises that we have in store? Um, what, what are the twists that we might not expect? Let me start with you, Saif. What, what, what are you thinking about? It's a very broad question. Thank you uh, for I know you've thought that. about it, so, you know. I, sure. I think um, uh, culture is facing a lot of opportunities and challenges uh, in the near and, and longer term future. I believe if I'm going to stick to the topic of the day, which is technology, technology is forcing some sort of convergence in the definition of culture. Uh, we find that everyone is uh, adopting one singular profile of likes, dislikes, uh, 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 following certain specific behaviors and identifying with each other. Uh, and I'll give you a very simple example. We talked about just now, uh, one of our colleagues said, you know, we can save on the carbon footprint of uh, these orchestras traveling by beaming, uh, you know, performances online. But the challenge with that is you are not now on the driver's seat. You will not be able to consume and interpret this content, interpret this culture for yourself. You will be driven by the comments you see by how other people are reacting online, and you perhaps uh, uh, be a victim of uh, negative interpretations of such culture. It's, it's, a, it's a personal opinion. So there are challenges, but technology, and I'm sure today we're going to talk about that, also presents a lot of solutions and opportunities. Uh, Ali, you're advising the Tate. You're a part of their young advisory board. So presumably, the, look, the, the, the focus is on the future. Absolutely. And, and what it, as, as you do, and I, I'm tempted to ask a very similar question here to Deborah, which is, as you imagine an institution like that in 2030, how is it different from the institution today? Well, I'm ex exactly this idea about, uh, you know, how does one control the message on social media? And I've only recently embraced the fact that I'm a millennial because I always thought, oh. Have you resisted it? <laughs> I have, you just I'm, didn't not, want to admit. I'm not on social media. I have no Instagram, no Facebook, no Twitter. So, you know, th this is kind of incredible for me to see just how, you know, connected people are in real time constantly. Please, somebody tweet something about Alia <laughs> up there, so um, it, it introduces her to the 21st century. But I don't deny that it's an extremely important way of communicating. And I mean, even for us with the Tate Young Patrons, it has been a struggle to try to explain to the Tate, because the Tate is a government institution. I mean, you know, the director is government appointed, the board is government appointed, I mean, I'm sure as, you know, Adrian being a, a Londoner is also well aware that the Tate functions in a very different way. Uh, so when we try to control the message about the Tate Young Patrons, and I'm like, please, can we have our own Instagram account? I know we have tons of the young patrons who really would love to be involved. They're very resistant to that. It's only maybe a hashtag. So this idea of, you know, how does an institution control that? Well, on the other hand, I've, you know, kind of recently begun um, doing things with LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, who have completely, on the opposite side, embraced, you know, we had, you know, video live streaming of uh, the patrons event that we just recently did during Art Basel Hong Kong. We have a video that's being sent out to everybody who attended the event. So to see the two ways, and I'm sure, you know, Deborah is very, kind of aware of also like just these multiple ways in which institutions try to, you know, embrace modernity, but also maintain their heritage. And I mean the tape as being incredibly bureaucratic, but also wholly innovative with their new, uh, the new rehang of the collection. So, I mean, it's always this like kind of very uh, tenuous balance. Well, the, the, I'm sh I don't know if you've formally done this, but but you must have thought, you know, what is the Kennedy Center, one of the most important performing arts centers in the world, look like in 2030? How is it different from what it looks like today? If I may, I'll start a little bit back on the question that you offered to them and then talk about it as it relates that's, to that's this, a, because it's, it's the same. Because you live in Washington and that's I exactly I what I expect, <laughs> is that you will answer the question you want to answer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we all learned it, didn't we? I have a fundamental belief that what brings us all together, and the reason we're here 
sitting in a room together as opposed to all sort of wired in and watching each other from our home or our <coughs> office is that there, nothing replaces the live experience. And so whether you are looking at the real art or in the room with the performers, dance, theater, music, whatever it is, the live experience is what is really transcendental. That is the most important part of what we call culture. It's about being together. Um, even um, reading a book, which is culture, it's about going someplace real time, your imagination. Um, for me, technology is really critical because it helps bring people in. It connects us. It tells the story that doesn't get told in other ways. And so we have significantly ramped up our technology and our Facebook and our Twitter and our Instagram and all of the Facebook Live and live streaming and all of that. And all that it has done is increase the number of people who come into the building and experience the live moment. And so that, for me, is why technology is really critical. Um, for me, therefore, we will continue to advance that as much as we possibly can. Um, I had a really uh, uh, interesting anecdote, which was around uh, the sharing of the streaming of the Chicago Symphony. It was before I went to the Kennedy Center. And I got a true love letter from a woman in uh, Moscow, Idaho. And she was talking about how she had reconnected with her father, who loved the Verdi Requiem, and that the stream that the Chicago Symphony had put out on the internet was so powerful for her because she could never see the Verdi Requiem because she didn't live anywhere near a live performance. And this was as close to a live performance as she could get. So the technology can help advance um, the live experience, and it can enhance what you're doing to bring people in. It can tell your story. Um, it can keep you from having to travel around the world. But there's nothing like the live experience. Nothing like the live experience. And for the National Symphony Orchestra to have been in Moscow for Slava's 90th birthday, playing Shostakovich, no experience like that for the Russians or the Americans. So the live experience is what is so important. In the future, for the Kennedy Center, I see more of the same but it's a little bit different. I see us expanding what we offer and how we offer it, because I think we've lived in silos too long. For those of you who know anything about the Kennedy Center, you know that we have had little pods. I believe we wipe out the pods and it's one big mashup, and that we, we see art taking place in a lot of different ways, just the way we've seen it here uh, in the performances here. Do you see those kind of changes in, with the institutions you're dealing with? I do. Um, I, I see, uh, I'm a bit like um, Dr. Albright. I'm, a, I'm an optimist, but I'm, a, I'm a, also a, a sort of a worrier. And two sort of slightly lugubrious uh, um, prognoses, if you like. One is, one is that we've talked a lot over the last couple of days about um, instrumental role of culture in, in uh, partially compensating for some of the impact of whether we want to call it late capitalism or globalization. Um, gender inequality, um, uh, environmental degradation, and so forth, and the contribution instrumentally that culture can make towards that. But some of the other um, reactions to um, globalization, which we touched on, which include fundamentalism and include uh, nationalism, whether we're talking about China or whether we're talking about America or whether we're talking about Britain or whether we're talking about France, um, they also are, in various ways, instrumentalizing culture. Palmyra is cultural desecration, but it is also a form of cultural expression. So I have a sort of concern in the long term with respect to what is the future of culture, that our instrumental, instrumentalization, if you like, of arguments around culture um, is a form of weaponization, and that over time um, we can see culture wars that are skirmishes now developing very strongly. And although we... I think there's probably a consensus in this room around um, us feeling that we are right in instrumentalizing culture because we are on the side of the angels. Um, uh, we, can't never, we can't nevertheless ignore the fact that um, uh, the instrumentalization of culture is something that all sides take part in. Um, one person's cultural diplomacy is another person's propaganda. Um, according to The Economist, the, America, the United States spent about 700 million on cultural diplomacy last year. 
um, China spent 10 billion um, US dollars on cultural diplomacy last year. Um, is that diplomacy or is it propaganda? So I think that uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, thoughts as, as we run ahead is uh, for the future of culture is, are we entering an epic period of culture wars at a fundamental level? Um, another, I think, uh, really uh, relating uh, slightly more to um, uh, uh, institutional culture is that the institutions of high culture, the um, legacy institutions, if you like, of orchestras, of ballet companies, of theaters, of museums, are probably in for a fairly tough time. Because if you look at uh, a lot of the creativity that's been talked about in this room, um, both audiences and artists are looking for informality. They're looking for um, uh, flexibility. They're looking for a breakdown in the, uh, the traditional division of labor between for-profit and not-for-profit, between consumption and production, between uh, different art forms. And many of the larger institutions find that extremely difficult. They are um, sclerotic, they are inflexible, they have, uh, they're risk-averse, they're hierarchical. And so you can see a chapter ahead in which, if you like, the institutional bulk, bulk of, 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 of cultural institutions, you might call them legacy institutions on the one hand, uh, are struggling loudly to survive. And creativity and um, audiences are almost um, forming outside them. So I see, um, uh, I, I give those as two sort of notes of caution because as, as we look forward, I can see real challenges for the cultural sector in responding to the changing times that we live in. Can I an answer to that? And I, I guess it's a, a point of, of slight optimism of how I've seen you know, the Tate respond to that, an institution that I have struggled with, with their bureaucracy and their hierarchy and all of the rest of it, but that has recently launched the tanks program, which mm -hmm. is converting their oil tanks that was you know, part of the original mill, um, converting them into a performance art space, which mm -hmm. is the first of a major museum to create a performance art space that directly speaks to artists who want to do you know, more ephemeral projects and projects that you know, happen very quickly and can be programmed very quickly. So at the same time, there is this ability you know, to pivot and to create and to respond to the modern needs. And above the tanks, you have the switch house, which I've always thought you know, in the last, now it's been nine months, that if the switch house had opened one year previously, I don't think we would have had Brexit. The Tate has that power. The Switch House, in responding to Darren Walker's comment yesterday about American museums not you know, having you know, other ideas of America within their American sections, that the Tate has created within their permanent collection conversations of artists from the Middle East, from Africa, from Asia, centered around uh, discussion points. So there isn't an uh, a room of American pop artists. There's a room of pop art, and it's artists from all over the world discussing that topic. Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. I want to ask Deborah a question. I'm going to come then to Safe as, and, and take a look at the sort of the planning of it. But there, let's stipulate that live experience will never go away, and there's a, a value to the live experience. But the world of institutions has also been a world of choice and exclusion and bottlenecks, and it makes it hard for artists to get in, to get recognized. They're, you know, they're, 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 whether it's for, you know, because of the judgment of a curator, or the judgment of a producer, or something else. And um, now, of course, we see that a lot of the tools that existed that once were the private property of institutions or the private property of big businesses to market, to reach people, to distribute, and so forth, they're now free. And so an artist can bypass an institution and develop a big audience. An artist can say, uh, you know, or they can come up with an alternative means of performance. You know, there's a, there's a network around the world, there's several of them, but there's one that, that, I, that I know of that's fairly big, where people perform in living rooms. And in and, and hundreds of living rooms around the world, and you go to a website, and you see what city you're in, and they go in, and they have live, intimate performances with 50 people, and all the negatives of that bureaucracy fall away. Now, now that's, it's not an either-or. We, we're doing this thing. These, both things exist. But it is, that is a bit of a kind of a challenge to the traditional role of the institution, right? Yes, it is, obviously. Um, on the other hand, we have at the Kennedy Center at least, we have the ability to be both. 
And that's what I'm working really hard on, is to invite those artists who have not traditionally been at the Kennedy Center and to, to make those big, gigantic, iconic marble walls look a little bit more porous. So we're doing a whole lot more that is um, what you might normally have been found in a neighborhood or in a community center or in a living room. And we are now actually creating those spaces exactly the same way, that are smaller, more flexible, more intimate, um, more experimental. Because I think absolutely the future is about having that opportunity to be closer to the artist, to be more immersed in the art that's being performed, understand how it's being created as well. But it's really interesting, and this is not true just at the Kennedy Center, it was true in other places as well um, prior to my in my other experience, is that moment when the YouTube artist can say, and now I'm on the stage of Orchestra Hall, and isn't this amazing? That still happens. That YouTube artist that has built their following, one person, one click at a time, is thrilled to be seen in that moment as well. So I think our environment is changing. I think it is one plus one, not one or the other. I think that there is great opportunity and a lot more creativity and, and actually um, perhaps much more exciting art that's going to be taking place because it doesn't mean an executive at a recording company or in a movie company or television is responsible for their success. They have that in their own hands. Right, and, and we just saw that with the Grammys. Chance the Rapper became the first self-distributed artist mm -hmm. to win a Grammy Award. Yep. So, you know, totally new means of distribution. Now, each of you face different challenges in planning a, the board of a museum or running a performing arts center. Governments also face these kind of challenges because when you in an organization like TCA are planning out, you've got a Louvre opening here, maybe a few years later there's a Guggenheim opening, you're opening uh, the Zayed Museum, Sadiat is growing, and the current plan is going to reach fruition, you know, 10 years from now in a different cultural environment. And so the question is, how do you reconcile those things? How do you think a couple moves ahead? Thank you for that, David. Is this working? Um, can I take a minute to just maybe tell the audience what TCA does? Of course. Sure. So uh, we're the Tourism and Culture Authority. Uh, and we uh, handle three big sort of sectors. We work, we handle the tourism sector as a policy sector and a regulator. We work in the culture sector. And we also oversee the libraries, the public libraries in the Emirates of Abu Dhabi. For the purpose of this discussion, I'll just give you a very high level brief on what we do in the cultural sector. Uh, first and foremost, we, we preserve, we protect our cultural heritage. Uh, and that means the intangible stuff, uh, like the performing arts you saw today. So we keep that alive by having these events take place. We document it. We would use technology to beam it across the world and so on and so forth. The gastronomy. We have the restaurants, like the beautiful restaurant you went to when you first uh, started discussing the summit. Uh, and, and then you have the, the, the historical sites. And we have sites dating back to the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, and it's about how do you excavate, how do you restore, what is that narrative that you build around it, and how do you expose tourists to it? And that's also very important for us. Uh, on the urban culture side, we have the art fair, Abu Dhabi Art, which is run by Diana Nuseba. Uh, we have our museums, uh, two, two, two in Al Ain. We have the Louvre Abu Dhabi opening this year, and then the other two museums in, in the very near future. Uh, and then, and then we, we work on also uh, various sort of global initiatives, such as the International Conference for Protection of Heritage and Antiquities, which we co chaired with France, and we raised a lot of money to do this, and where technology can also play a role. Uh, and so on and so forth. What are the challenges we face? No, but you forgot your, the thing you're most proud of. The summit. Culture summit, yeah, exactly. Of course. Right. <laughs> I was going to get to that at the end. Yeah, right. Um, so what are the challenges we face? Uh, I think I can't summarize them in a few sentences, but I'll first start with the challenge that is facing the cultural sector all over the world, and I think I can also see hints of that in what my colleagues just said. It's funding. Whenever budgets are tight, wherever you are in the world, the first budget to be cut is the culture sector's budget. We haven't seen that here, thankfully, but we have to prepare for that day. I cannot continue to be a burden on the government. So what does that mean? You have to be innovative in how you uh, execute your programs. How can I make my delivery more efficient using technology and other tools as well? 
Uh, how can I raise funds from benefactors? What are the priorities of people who are interested in being patrons of the culture and arts, and how can I address them? Uh, what sort of policies can I build around that? The challenge we face in our region is we don't tax people. So I can't offer you credits in return for donations to, to the cultural sector. So it's an even bigger challenge for us here, in a sense. So that is one of the challenges. For us, uh, it's, it's about uh, preparing an audience. It's about changing mindsets, uh, cultural mindsets. And, and we do that through our programs, through our education programs. We launched the program just a few days ago. Talent identification. We start with kids from a very young age in school. We see who's talented in them, in any field, the music, the arts, and so on and so forth. And we, and we, we would like to, and we work with all of our partners, the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, the, the Louvre Abu Dhabi Museum, uh, Menarat Saadiyat, and all of our other institutions to develop this talent and take them all the way to graduation. If I can find 10,000 people or students with a bit of talent in them, and then 2,000 of them make it to their senior year and they're pros, that's a big accomplishment for us as a nation, for the world, because they're not only going to perform here, they're going to be our ambassadors, they're our cultural diplomats, and so on and so forth. An audience, an audience has to be ready for what's coming for these museums. And, but you also have to be respectful of their needs. You have to also, for example, I'll give you a very simple example. The Louvre Abu Dhabi is not only going to be uh, comprised of uh, collections that we've bought for that museum, as well as loans from France, from our partners in France, but we will have pieces from here, from our collections in Al Ain, from Sharjah, from uh, museums and institutions of the region, because we want to use this museum as a tool to explain to visitors what our culture and history is all about. And at the same time, uh, we want to also tell people here is that we are going to use this very important tool to also tell the world our story. And that's quite important. Uh, technology will play a very important role. The trick is with museums, I know you said there are a lot of challenges. How do I get a repeat visitor out of you? How do I build loyalty in you? And that's where tech comes into play. And that's where the programming that you build around your collection comes into play. Um, that's more or less kind of my two pence on it. But no, no, that's a, I mean, it's, a, it's a good overview. And I think one of the things that you brought up, which we haven't talked about here, we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to place it out there for further discussion. Um, uh, and then I'm going to ask for one question. I'll have time for just one question here. Is um, education. You talked about education. We talk about the future of culture. The future of culture is the future consumers of culture and the future yes. artists of culture. And if you cut back on education, Absolutely. you cut back on access, it's got the a consequence. Highest yeah. correlation, the yes. highest correlation between subsequent engagement with the arts, either as a yes. practitioner or as, a, as, as a, um, an appreciator, is your exposure formally or informally during your school years, either through your family or through um, education. And if you don't have the privilege of it being through your family and you're deprived of that access through um, it not being part of integral to the curriculum, then you have a generation, as you have now two, three generations in the United States who have been deprived of that experience, and that filters through immediately into visitor and attendance numbers. And, well, I, and I think that history, all the, the data. history A-level uh, yes. case yeah. in the UK where the government recently tried to uh, get rid of art history as a yeah. subject in the schools in the entire artistic and cultural community came together and wrote multiple letters, lobbied the ministers, and, and all ministers, not just the Ministry of Culture, and they reinstated it. So, sorry. Can, I, can I just, just one comment. I talked about funding, and there's something that I've been discussing with David for a while, and maybe we will you know, engage all of the participants here on it. I won't go into exact details, but everyone should work together to, 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 be able to try to quantify uh, the, 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 the economic value, the social value of whatever investments I made in the cultural sector. It, it can't be treated as a PNL, mm -hmm. in a sense. Uh, you know, uh, arts and culture creates academically excellent mm -hmm. students, it creates uh, adds value to your economy, creates more tolerant societies, or able to create even more. And that that has to be somewhat calculated, quantified, expressed, so that we can continue to drive this cultural agenda forward. Right, and UNESCO does do some interesting numbers in that regard. They're sort of more traditionally economic, but there are other issues like access to culture, the impact of access to culture, how that fosters creativity, how creativity fosters growth, um, what, how it fosters collective knowledge, how it figures in what you might call a country's gross knowledge product, 
as opposed to its gross domestic product. And I, and I think, uh, apropos of Adrian's point, I, I, do, I do think the case is true with uh, performing arts uh, venues that the single biggest li you know, contributor to whether somebody's likely to go and see a concert is whether they took music as a kid. Mm -hmm. If they, they were true. The, 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 the analytics are, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we all used to complain because we lived in a sort of data-free zone and all we had was sort of rather crude economic impact studies. I think we're living in a different environment now. The techniques are much more sophisticated. Um, uh, your ability to get, um, to, to gather data, the economics of that have changed through, you know, survey monkey and, monkey and so forth. The, the works of intermediary Americans for the Arts and others around the world in developing uh, methodologies. So although we're not there yet, the methodology of social impact, the methodology of wider economic impact, and the ability to collect data is much more sophisticated than it was. And it's really incumbent upon us as practitioners to go out and drag that data and those techniques into our world to use them in a sort of um, And we, we're kind fashion. of in the Jurassic era of data, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We're about to enter the big data era. When you enter an era in which there are 50 billion devices on the internet, 10 or 12 of them are connected to you. Those devices are going to know when you wake up, what you're eating, um, uh, what you're listening to, how long you listen to what you're listening to, when you turn it off, what are you buying, what are the patterns, et cetera, et cetera. And so big data analysis is going to become part of how you market culture, how you evaluate cultural audiences. We've got literally just one minute. It'll be less than a minute. Okay. I'm a Cuban American composer, conductor living in England, and I'm a performer and I record. And I want to introduce a word that I only heard once, and it's vibes. And by vibes, I mean energy. And there is a level of energy that is communicated in a live performance that no matter how good you're streaming, no matter how, much, how good your video, it'll never be the same. And once you realize what you gain, you keep on going. No, that's, that's undoubtedly true. But you know, I, I do vibes. think, I, as I was thinking to the, listening to some of this conversation, another thing that strikes me is, there's different kinds of vibes. And if you're a kid and you're in high school and somebody says to you, hey, you gotta go and watch this, or they tweet it to you, and then other kids tweet it to you, and by the end of the night, you know, everybody in your high school has seen it 10 times, that's a different energy. And you have to recognize that energy has a certain kind of psychic and social power, just like the energy in the room. We gotta figure out how to harness this. I wish we could keep going on this conversation. I hope this conversation informs the workshop discussions. I hope this conversation uh, informs future culture summits and, and, we, and we talk about some of these ideas, translating them into action. We've got one more really great performance by a, a, a local Emirati star. And, uh, and so what I'd like to ask you to do is to join me in thanking this, crowd, this, this group for a great uh, performance and then Carla will come down and introduce the performer. So join me in thanking them. Thank you.